well, thank you, everybody. It's 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 an honor. It's a it's a privilege to be here. Uh, this is the first time I get to be a guest speaker anywhere, so it's very exciting for me, very humbling for me as well. Uh, when when uh, Pastor Angel came up to me and, and asked if I would be willing to do it, I, I kind of looked over, like, me? You mean me? <laughs> and uh, I was just uh, grateful to be able to help out uh, in his absence. So uh, thank you guys for welcoming me here. Uh, today we're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, so if you could... Uh, Go ahead and uh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. We'll get started there in just a moment. Uh, just a little bit about myself. As Isaac had mentioned, I, I go to Calvary Chapel, Redeeming Grace, and we're all the way in Horizon City now. We flew us all the way from Horizon to, to Northeast El Paso. Uh, and um, I, I, I teach the youth. I teach the, the little kids, the elementary age kids. Uh, so I'm very blessed to do that. And uh, the Lord's just been uh, using, using me in, in that capacity. And uh, I also am a homeschool dad. My, my kids are homeschooled. And uh, I, I also teach at a Christian private school. So uh, this, this, this setting, this church right here is just like, this is really good for me because I, I like the small group and, and just being able to, to see everybody. So this is, I was mentioning to Isaac, this is perfect. Um, so like I said, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Uh, as I said, we were, I, uh, I teach the youth, and, and we're, we're actually going to, similar to, to your, your guys' youth. We, we're going through Acts as well. I don't know uh, where they're at in Acts, but we're, we're in chapter 10. Uh, we kind of go in pretty slow through it. Uh, we started uh, over a year ago, a year and a half almost, and we're barely in chapter 10. Uh, but this is in chapter 9. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then uh, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for today, Lord, and, and that, that we're all here this morning, that you uh, got us out of bed, that you got us here safely, and uh, we're here to hear from you, Father God, through your word. Uh, so may you bless, uh, bless this teaching, Lord. May, may it uh, uh, just be a blessing to, to the people that are here, uh, Lord, uh, that uh, you would help us to be attentive to your word, that we would receive what you have for each and every one of us, Lord. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for, for this time. I just encourage to see the saints gathered, and, and, and we're here to, to worship you and to learn from your word, Lord. And, and we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I titled this message, Healing. And this is one of those topics in the church that, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions about. There's even, there's even debates about healing. And it, it could be a, a, touching, a touchy subject in, in many respects, because uh, I know we've all had a situation that we've been in, or maybe currently, where we need healing for one thing or another. Or maybe we know somebody that needs healing. And we, we have the questions, and, and again, there's debates about, does God still heal today the way that He healed back then? Those, those crazy stories that we read in the Bible of, of Jesus telling the person just to stand and walk, and, and He stands and walks. Does God still do those types of things today? Also, we want to know, are there certain people that God has, has given a, a gift that they're able to, to do those sorts of things and to heal, right? So we have a lot of questions. We, we, we want to know uh, more about that. And of course, God's Word is, is the source. But what today I want, to, I want to focus on is the purpose of healing, the purpose of why God would heal somebody. And... Uh, as, as, as we get started, uh, I like to, with, with the youth group, I like to kind of start off with kind of like some, some memes, some funny things for, for the kids to, to get warmed up, uh, and, and they all relate to our topic of healing. So the first one, we have uh, the, the guy on his laptop, and he's obviously researching some, some medications that he, he might need to take. And of course, we've seen the commercials, we've seen the ads where, you know, you, you got this really awesome medication, everybody's like, you know, running and jumping uh, they're on the beach, on the playground, stuff like that. And then, you know, it almost wants you to be distracted by those images because the voice in the background goes, may cause diarrhea, vomiting, headache, death, even fatigue, which I thought that was funny that they switched the death and fatigue because I, I think death would be a worse thing. And then the guy says, you know, what a relief, right? So, and the point of that, a lot of people... Uh, you know, when, when they're suffering physically, you know, we turn to medication, and not that that's wrong, because God has given us that, that gift of, of modern medicine to, to help heal our bodies, but sometimes the, the uh, reliance 
on these medications, kind of we 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 step away from from asking God for the healing and say, well, you know, I got this medication, which a lot of times the uh, the side effects are, are worse than what you started with. Um, so so that's that's what 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 some people do. They they kind of focus in on those those prescription medications. And then uh, I have this one where, you know, you see the, the, the guy, uh, obviously he's been shot or injured in some way. Medic, I'm going to need some healing crystals and scented oils over here, stat. So a lot of people will turn to uh, these types of like more uh, natural, uh, I'll say hippie uh, versions of, of healing remedies. Uh, I, I know not, not that those things are wrong, that, well, the crystals probably, but the, the oils, the oils are okay. I mean, our, our family, we, we've done oils and, and, and nothing wrong with that. But obviously in this situation, uh, oils aren't going to do much for you. Um, but, but people do turn to those, those means as, as an alternative to, to going to God in prayer and asking for that healing. Uh, and then this last one is um, what our hope is, right? Because we know in this world there will be pain and suffering and, and eventually there will be death. So we have uh, the Christian family member dies, and then the secular friend who has, you know, kind of no perspective, eternal perspective, says, it's so sad that we will never see him or them again. And then, you know, the Christian with that, that smile, that smile, because we know that this is not all there is, that there is uh, heaven to look forward to, and, and we get to be reunited with, with our loved ones in Christ. So that, that is the blessing. That's the, the hope. And we'll talk about that uh, later on in, the, in this message. So as I said, we're going to be looking in Acts. Specifically, we're going to be looking at chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. Uh, and then we're going to be um, focusing on Peter, the apostle Peter, the, the disciple, you know, that Peter, that guy, right, that we all know from the Gospels. Uh, he was one of the three main guys that Jesus ministered to, that he uh, brought along with him, uh, that he taught. Uh, it was him, Peter, James, and John, right? How many times in the Bible? Peter, James, and John. So it's, it's, that, that's who we're going to be looking at today, Peter. And uh, if you've read through the Gospels and you know something about Peter, you know uh, all of his, his characteristics, right? Peter is this impulsive guy, right? He often speaks without thinking. He, he reacts to things in the extreme. And I'm going to kind of go over some of his highlights and, and some of his lowlights, if you will. Uh, and, and, and the thing about Peter is that many of us, many of us can relate to Peter and, and, and all his characteristics and who he is. So again, some of Peter's highlights and, and some of his lowlights. Uh, first we have Peter, aside from Jesus himself, is the only other person that walked on water. So he was brave enough to say to Jesus, you know, the storm's going, Jesus is on water, everybody's like, what in the world is going on? Peter says, I want to do that too. So he jumps off the, the boat and he starts walking, he takes a few steps, and then not too long after those few steps, he, 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 he gets a little nervous, right? And he gets scared, he starts sinking, and, uh, you know, he shows his great faith and bravery, and then on the, other, the next second, he, he's, he's sinking, and he's, he's crying out to, to Jesus, please help me, I'm sinking, and, and then Jesus says, Peter, don't worry, don't be afraid. Uh, something else about Peter is uh, how many times did Peter tell Jesus, Jesus, I, I would die for you. No, and, and he went as far as to, to kind of insult his friends, the other uh, disciples. He said, even if these other losers say that, you know, even if they all run away and, and scatter and, and everything, they, they, if they forsake you, never me, never me. But then we, what do we read later? that he denies Jesus three times. Not just one time, he denies Jesus three times. Uh, think back to when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and he comes to Peter. And of course, Peter's got something to say, right? He said, all these other guys, they, you know, they, they let Jesus wash their feet. But me, I'm not going to do that, because you know, Jesus shouldn't do that. I'm, I'm not worthy for Jesus. So he kind of, he says, Jesus, never, never me. You will not wash my feet. And then Jesus tells Peter, well, Peter... If I don't do this, you have no part in me. So then again, the extreme, he's all, from never wash my feet, he's all, oh, pour the bucket on my head, Lord. You know, wash me completely. And, and Peter just kind of didn't get it. Um, then think to the scene in the garden where uh, the, Jesus is about to be arrested. And here come the guys, here come the soldiers. 
And what does Peter do? He pulls out his sword, and then he's, he's, he's swinging. He, he chops off somebody's ear. And, and when, I, when I teach this to the kids, I say, he wasn't trying to chop off somebody's ear, right? I don't know if he was going to go around to all the soldiers chopping off ears. That's, that wasn't what he was trying to do. He was trying to chop off a head, right? Uh, and and we, we see that, that boldness that he has, that, that bravery that, that you know, he, obviously if he was thinking about things, uh, you know, he's not going to take on all of those soldiers and, and that angry mob by himself. Uh, so he, he, di- he does that. But then later on, what do we see? After uh, Jesus dies on the cross, he's up in, in a room and he's locked the doors because he's afraid of probably those same guys coming after him. So that's Peter, right? He's the one that said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God, which is the greatest thing that he probably said, right? That, that proclamation that, that he made. But then in that same chapter, he, he tells Jesus when Jesus says that he's going to die, he brings Jesus aside. He's like, come over, Jesus. Let me tell you something. That's not going to happen. He rebukes Jesus. And then he, he receives that line from Jesus, that famous line, get thee behind me, Satan, right? So we, we got the highs and lows, and I think we can identify with Peter in that regard because how many times have we been kind of on that mountaintop of our faith, but then not too long after that, we're, we're in the valley of, of faith. And, and, and God, I think Jesus picked Peter on purpose knowing what he was, what kind of guy he was to kind of help us, right? To, to be able to relate to him, to identify with him. Uh, and then we come to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, Peter has this transformation, right? The Spirit came. And, and, and all of those, those um, characteristics that we just talked about, his, his brashness and impulsiveness, it turns to boldness, right? We have Peter 2.0 now. And he's bold and he's able to uh, speak the truth without fear, He's able to argue for Jesus being the Messiah to the religious leaders, to the Jews. He said, this is the Messiah. This is Jesus. Um, And we can relate to Peter in that way as well, because all of our characteristics, the things that make up our personalities, that's us, God can use that. God can use, and he's not done with us. He's never done with us. So that's Peter. And uh, the focus, uh, like I said, the focus of this passage that we're going to get into is Peter. And what is he doing? What's the background here? Well, Peter is traveling around. He's not going on summer vacation. That's not what he's doing. Uh, he, he's not just taking a, a road trip for his own sake. Uh, I'm going to quote Gusick, David Gusick, a Bible commentator. It says, Peter went through all parts of the country. The previous pattern of the apostles staying put in Jerusalem and those needing ministry coming from afar to them now shifted. Peter went through all parts of the country to do ministry, traveling 35 miles, 55 kilometers, from Jerusalem to a city called Lydda. And it just harkens to mind Jesus' commission at the beginning of Acts. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Peter is, is doing this. This is being fulfilled right now as Peter is taking a walk from Jerusalem. And as he does this, he encounters two people and is able, God is able to use Peter to perform these miraculous healings. We meet a paralyzed man named Aeneas, and then we also are going to see a woman named Tabitha who has died. And Those are the kind of the highlights, but the thing that we cannot overlook is the other healing that we see, the healing of another, the spiritual healing, as these physical healings that Peter performs lead people to Jesus, lead people to Christ, right? So as you can see on here, uh, our main text, and then I've broken it down. Uh, We're going to look at Aeneas first in verses 32 through 34. Then we're going to take a look at Tabitha, verses 36 through 41. And then we're going to look at the people who believe through these healings in verses 35 and also 42 and 43. And as we go through this, the question that we want to focus on is what is the significance of these physical healings that we see in the passage? And also, what is the significance of physical healing in general, even in our lives today? 
So let's go ahead and read the passage. Uh, starting in verse 32, it says, As Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. And all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Verse 36, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She was always doing good works and acts of charity. About that time, she became sick and died. After washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there and sent two men to him who urged him, don't delay in coming with us. Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, he led them to an upper room or a room upstairs. All the windows approached him. I'm sorry, all the widows approached him, weeping and showing the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, prayed, and turned toward the body. Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He he gave her his hand and helped her stand up. He called the saints and widows and presented her alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. So, as I mentioned before, the first uh, part of this, we see uh, the healing of a man named Aeneas, who, uh, of course, is, is paralyzed. It says of Aeneas that, uh, well, first of all, in verse 32, we see that uh, Peter is traveling from place to place. And as I mentioned before, this is not uh, him just taking a stroll, right? He's traveling from Jerusalem to uh, the city uh, of, of, um, of Lydda. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, the evangelistic efforts of the apostles was concentrated in Jerusalem, right? They kind of didn't want to uh, stray too far away from Jerusalem where Jesus died and he rose and he was with them those 40 days. Um, so they, they wanted to stay there. But then persecution broke out against the Christians, against the church, and that kind of forced people away from Jerusalem. So that's what's going on here. Uh, and, and of course, the persecution, you know, you hear that word and that, of course, has, you know, negative connotation with it, like persecution is bad. Uh, but remember, God uses that. God uses persecution. In this case, it is used to spread the gospel. The gospel spreads uh, throughout the region and eventually it would go to the ends of the earth, just like Jesus said. Right? And it's something that we as Christians are participating in even today. We're taking the gospel everywhere we can so that every ear can hear the good news about Jesus. Right? It says in Ephesians 6, uh, the, it talks about the armor of God and one of the pieces of the armor are the shoes. The shoes that are fitted for the gospel of peace. So if you ever wonder why, why are shoes you know, part of the, the armor, right? And, just, and back then they didn't have, you know, the... The, the cool shoes that we have then, you know, they're sandals. So how is that a piece of armor, right? Uh, but the implication of the gospel being represented by shoes is that we got to go. I, I tell my kids when we're going to go somewhere, the first thing I say, put on your shoes. We're going to go, right? If, if you're a parent or, or you, you know parents, you know that uh, kids, that that's one of the struggles that we have as parents. You know, I can't find my shoes and, you know, where are my shoes and why are you in the van and there are no shoes on your feet? Uh, but shoes signify that we're going to go somewhere. Uh, if, if I walk in, 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 if I walk into the room and I got uh, I got my shoes on, the kids are like, "Where are you going, Daddy? Can I go too?" Right? So because because we know that shoes are for for going, and in the same way, uh, this is what Peter's doing. He's got his shoes on and he's going and he's going to deliver the gospel. Uh, it says in verse thirty-two also that he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda, and I want to focus on that word saints. For a minute. Um, this is the first place in the book of Acts that, that Luke uses that word, the word saints. And saints refers to uh, us who believe in Jesus, Christians. And there's a kind of a misconception about that word uh, with other religions and even secular uh, ideas about that word. Saint is like this, this super 
person, the super moral person that's good and, 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 and does everything right and, and never says, never gets mad, nothing like that. Uh, maybe a person that has even uh, done miracles, things like that, right? Uh, th there's this conception that, that a saint is like a super spiritual person, this higher level, right? The saints are up here and we're kind of down here and, and we're just looking up to them. But that's not what the Bible says a saint is. And that's not what we should think a saint is. Uh, it, a saint refers to the fact that we believe in Jesus, that we are his children, that we have been set apart, that we are different from the world, that we are not of the world, though we are in the world. And this status that we have, being his saints, it's not because of anything we did, right? I didn't live uh, this perfect life to be called a saint. I didn't do this great act of charity to be a saint. Um, I, did, I became a saint because of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus' work on the cross is what gives me that status. And it, it, it's awesome uh, to, to, to know when, when I'm, I'm going to a place like, like here, uh, you know, we're, we're gathering together, we're the saints, and, and even though I come uh, from, from Calvary Chapel of Redeeming Grace and, and you guys are here at Fresh Vision, like we are all the saints. We are here for, for, for God. Uh, we are here to follow Jesus, to learn from his word. We have all a common experience. We have a bond because we have that common experience of being saved by the work of Jesus. We have a common worldview that comes from our belief in the Bible, right? We all believe the Bible. We follow the things that have been commanded for us to follow in his word. So we all have that. And we all have a common hope because we know that uh, as saints, as believers, that we get to be in heaven enjoying that fellowship, that bond forever. And, and this, this unity that we, that we have, it, it goes beyond borders, right? Because I can go to a, a different uh, church, I can go to a different city, a different state, and if I'm in a Calvary Chapel or I'm in a, a good church, I know that, you know, we're all the saints and we've gathered for, for the Lord, right? It goes beyond language. So there, there are saints all over the world, and um, even though we're all kind of in our different congregations or different places, we are all united in Christ. We are one in that sense. Ephesians 4 Verses 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. And I like that, that imagery at the end where it talks about God being above us, watching over us, and that He is through us, through all. He is working through us, and He is in all. We know that God is always with us. So then we go to verse 33. And in verse 33, it says, There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. So here's where we have Aeneas in his situation, his condition, right? He's, he's been paralyzed. It doesn't say why he's paralyzed, what happened to him, but this has been going on for eight years where he has not been able to, to function to move normally as he would before this eight years of, of paralysis um, and, and, you know, put yourself in his shoes. And you've been this way for eight years, so there's like no chance I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to like get up and walk and be normal again, right? It's been eight years, what makes me think that the next day things are going to be any different, right? We have uh, that feeling of hopelessness he must feel. Right, that frustration that he must feel, and maybe you've been in a in a spot like that where where things uh, are 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 not looking good, and they've been like that for a while, and and you're just frustrated. And then with him, like I think the the thing with me that would get to me the most is feeling useless. Like I'm just here, laying here. I have to rely on other people to help me, and I can't do anything to help my family. I can't do anything. Uh, in the church, right? And, and that would get to me. And I know uh, if you've ever been in a situation similar, it's frustrating. Where you kind of feel like you're put on the shelf and you're just kind of there. We read about other people in Scripture. Uh, for example, John chapter 5, Jesus encounters a man who uh, was disabled in some way. It doesn't give a description of his condition, but he was, he was disabled 
for 38 years. He was just hanging out by a pool, hoping that he could get inside and, and somehow be healed in that way. Uh, there's a man earlier in the book of Acts, and he was uh, in Acts chapter 3, uh, begging by the, the temple gate, asking for money. And he was like that since his birth. He's over 40 years old. And he was lame. He couldn't walk. And he'd been like that for 40 years. In the Gospels, there's an account of a guy who uh, was paralyzed and he was just laying on a mat and he had to rely on his four friends, I'm assuming it's four because there's four corners on the mat, uh, to take him around and take him where he needs to go. So again, we, we kind of can put ourselves, imagine that situation and, and how uh, awful it must have been for that man. Then in verse 34, this is where we get the healing. It says, Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. So the first thing he says, he says, Jesus heals you. And I think that's, that's, that's a great way to put it because Peter knows it didn't come from himself. right? Any good thing that we are able to do, that comes from the Lord. It's the Lord working in us and through us. And Peter acknowledged that because he says, Jesus heals you. Gusick says, Peter clearly identified who healed Jesus the Christ. Peter was only his instrument. Jesus healed with the power of Jesus. So Jesus healed with the power of Jesus. But he, Peter did not heal with the power of Peter. Peter relied solely on the power of Jesus. So I like that imagery of, of being an instrument, right? I'm not a musical person, but I appreciate music, and I appreciate people who can play music, like guitar or whatever. Uh, and we know a, a musical instrument doesn't do anything which is there, right? It has to be in the hands of somebody who can play it, a musician. And in the same way, on, on, on our own, by ourselves, we can't do anything. We have to be used by God. We have to be in the master's hands. And Peter acknowledged this. He knew this. He knew by himself he could not heal anybody, not even of a paper cut, much less paralysis, right? But he knew Jesus could, and he was just being used by God. And in the name of Jesus, Aeneas was healed. So then notice what he tells him. He says, Jesus heals, heals you, now get up, right? So this is a command, right? He says, get up. He didn't say, he didn't suggest, hey, you might want to try to see if you can maybe move around a little bit, get up, right? This wasn't like wishful thinking, like, oh, maybe he can get up. Maybe if I pray hard enough or if, if I, I stand here enough, long enough, maybe he can get up. No, he knew. He didn't have any doubts. Probably running through his mind all those times Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith, right? This time his, his faith was, was, was there in the right spot, and he knew that God was going to use him to heal this man. Also, the command comes with a chore. In verse 34, get up and make your bed, right? So uh, I, I kind of had to you know, tell, tell the kids this morning that, Kind of same thing. Get up and go make your bed. Let's come. Let's come to church, guys. Uh, and and when I'm teaching the youth, uh, you know, this this would have been a good time to to emphasize the importance of chores and and, and doing. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but the but the point of that is, you know, Jesus healed you. You were paralyzed. Now you can get up and you can move and you can walk. Now do something, right? God doesn't want us just to sit around with our uh, uh, with our health and do nothing with it, right? That's the purpose of us having two legs that, that work and, and being able to, to move and do things is so that we can worship God and be useful to Him. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So that's not about, hey, Aeneas, you know, you're good now, so you can sit around and watch Netflix the rest of your... No. No, what can you do? We can use you now in the church to, to serve. We can, we can use you to minister now, right? So that's what the purpose of this healing was. And also in verse 34, that word that I want to emphasize, immediately he got up. It wasn't like Peter said, all right, you're going to be healed, and I'll come back in a couple weeks and see how you're doing. Maybe you can move a leg. Or, you know, this was no doubt a miracle from God, right? This wasn't just, you know, a natural him getting better. Of course, it wasn't going to happen after eight years, but there was no delay. This was an instantaneous healing. He went from fully paralyzed 
to fully healed in the blink of an eye. So there was no doubt that this was a miracle and this something only God can do. And in, the, and, and in that way, God is the one that gets the glory. So then we turn to the next healing, which is of Tabitha in verses 36 through 41. Uh, so about Tabitha, again, quoting Gusick, uh, both the names Dorcas and Tabitha mean deer. And if I were her, I, I think I would go with Tabitha. Uh, that, that, just, that just sounds like a nicer name there. Uh, the woman was a beloved member of the Christian community in Joppa because she was full of good works and charitable, charitable deeds. Luke, was, Luke noted that Tabitha was full of good works and charitable, de charitable deeds, which she did. Some people are full of good works and charitable deeds, but they are only full of them in their minds and hearts. They don't actually do them as Tabitha did. So if we look at um, the verse here, or the verses here, uh, verse 36, uh, there was a disciple named Tabitha. I want to focus on that word for a second, that she was a disciple. She wasn't just a fan of Jesus. She wasn't just interested in some of the things he said, right? She didn't just have, you know, uh, subscribe to his, his, his podcast. No, he, she was a follower. She was a student. And I think all of us need to be that way. We all need to be students of the master, students of Jesus. And how do we do that? Well, I, I, as a teacher, I know that there's three phases really to, to being a student. The first phase is that you need to learn the subject. You need to learn who Jesus is. And how do we do that? Well, that part's obvious, right? We read his word. We, we come to church and we listen to the sermon and, and we learn from that, right? We do Bible study, right? And so we, we fill our minds with that subject. In this case, it's, it's Jesus. Um, and that's something that as, as a teacher, as, as, as a youth leader, and as a children's ministry uh, uh, teacher, that's something that I want to make sure I, I do, that the kids... And the young adults that I teach, that they know the Word of God, that they know the stories and the commands and everything written in this. And that is important, right? So is, you, we, we know that, um, you know, you can ask, you know, hopefully my daughter, I don't know where she went, but that you could ask her, you know, about Noah and about Moses and about Jonah, and she knows, she knows those things. Uh, not everything, but, you know, that's, that's the point that at each age, you know, we get more knowledge. And, and we never stop being students in that way. We never stop learning. You could read the Bible from cover to cover and not learn everything there is to learn. That's why, you know, once you get to the cover, the, the, the end of it, you, you kind of flip it over and start again, right? Because there's, there's, no, there, there's, no, there's no such thing as, oh, I read the Bible once, so, you know, I'm good. No, we keep learning. We keep learning. So that's the first phase is to learn the subject. And then the second phase is that we want to put what we learn into practice, right? Um, we want to make sure that we walk out our faith. All the things that are in here, we want to be able to turn that knowledge into wisdom, into godly living. Um, so it doesn't do me any good if I, my head is filled with, with you know, the verses and, and stories from the Bible, if I never do anything with that, right? What if I, you know, uh, it may, maybe it'll help me if I'm ever watching Jeopardy and, and a Bible question comes out and I, boom, I got that right. But that doesn't do anything, right? And, and just as an aside, I don't know if you guys saw that story recently where uh, in, in Jeopardy, there was a super easy basic Bible question and all three of those people are like blank. They didn't know it. They didn't know it. It was, it was super basic. And... Um, you know, and these are the smart, like, you know, they don't just pick people off the street to be on Jeopardy. You got to pass a test. And you, you know, it's, it's, you know, these are smart people and they don't know stuff like that, which, you know, kind of as a teacher kind of urges me to make sure that, that I teach well so that people know, right? People understand. But like I said, it's not just about that. We got to put the Bible into practice. Okay. So that's the second phase. And then the third phase in this is that we explain, are able to explain the truth to others. So we, we learn, we put it into practice, and then we explain our faith to others. We argue for our faith, right? We contend, like, like it says in Jude, we contend for the faith. Um, and like I said, we are 
as Christians, each and every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest of us, are called to be disciples of Jesus, right? There's no, no such thing as too young. There's no such thing as too old when it comes to being a disciple. So going back to verse 36, it says that she was always doing good works and acts of charity. Uh, notice, this, notice that word always, right? She was always doing good works. And like, something that she did on a regular basis continually. It was her reputation, right? It was what she was known for. And all of us need to have a reputation, right? Whether we acknowledge it or not, or whether we think about it or not, we all have a reputation. When somebody says your name to another person, there's automatically a thought about who this person is. So when Tabitha's name is brought up, oh, that's that lady that she uh, did a bunch of good work. She, she did acts of charity. You know, she was, she was good, right? She, she was just an awesome lady, right? And I think all of us want to be, to be thought of well by others, to be thought of well in this way. Uh, to have that good reputation. The Bible says in the Proverbs that uh, it emphasizes the importance of a reputation, that it's more valuable than even money. So that was her reputation. And, but she, she understood being a disciple like she was. She understood that her acts of charity, her good works, uh, those things were not what earned her salvation. She did not do these things in order to, to get favor from God because grace is unmerited, by definition, unmerited, undeserved favor from God. She understood that, and, and we need to understand, that our good works, the things that we do, are not in order to gain salvation, in order to earn the uh, favor of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So rather than these good works, these charitable, charitable deeds being something that was done in order to gain, this is something that is an outpouring of the grace that God has shown. So any good work that we do, any deed that we are able to accomplish, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's an outpouring. It's a response to the grace that God has shown us. And as mentioned earlier, it's only because of God working in us that we're able to do them in the first place. So in verse 37, this is kind of where, where things turn around, uh, where it says, about that time, she became sick and died. And obviously, this is, this is, this is a sad effect of sin in the world, right? God's original design for, for this planet and the people on, on it had nothing to do with sickness and death. Everything was perfect. Day after day, God said, this is good. This is good. This is very good. And then sin enters the world and messes all of that up, right? So we have now sickness, we have disease, we have injuries, we have uh, all sorts of things like that, ultimately culminating in death. And sickness, death, it, it affects everybody. Right? There's nobody immune, right? No matter how many shots you put in your arm, nobody's immune from getting sick. Nobody's immune from death. And even if you yourself, you know, you feel good, you're, you're healthy right now, you know, you probably know somebody, right, that's sick. You probably know, uh, have had a loved one that has passed, right? And, and we see the awful effects of sin uh, in our life, play out even in our own lives, but here specifically in verse 37, that Tabitha gets sick and she dies. Um, and then uh, they take her upstairs and they, they kind of have her there. And then as we go to uh, the next verse, verse 38, it says, uh, the disciples heard that Peter was there and, two, and sent two men to him to urge, and who urged him, don't delay in coming with us. So I think this is, this is amazing, right? This is an amazing act of faith. Uh, and, and no matter how you, you think about it or, or the exact situation, because uh, when did they exactly send these two guys to Peter? Was it before Tabitha actually died? Okay, so then we have some questions like, you know, kind of some speculation that we could do, but either way we come to the same conclusions. Um, if, it, if it was the case that they sent these guys before her death, you know, why were they sending him or did they want... Peter to come and, and to, you know, just speak some word 
of encouragement to her before she died? Did, did they want Peter to come and to comfort them, knowing that she was very close to death? Or, possibly, did they think that Peter could do something about this as he were, was to pray and heal her in Jesus' name? Right? So maybe they, they had those thoughts that maybe Peter can come and can pray over her and she'd get better. But maybe they were sent after Tabitha's death. It doesn't say exactly the timing there. And if they were sent to go get Peter after her, her death, why did they do it? Again, was it to bring Peter over here to, to, to pray for them and to comfort them having suffered this loss? Was it to kind of maybe officiate some sort of funeral ceremony? I don't know how they did things back then with that, that regard. Uh, or maybe, possibly, did they think, hey, even though she died, we can bring Peter over. Maybe he can still do something. Because they know, their disciples, they know what Jesus did. And Peter's an apostle. Maybe that can work out. So we read, speaking of Jesus and, and what he did, we read in the Gospels, specifically uh, Mark chapter 5, uh, a guy named uh, Jairus, he had a daughter. And he comes up to Jesus. He's a, he's a Jewish leader. And he comes up to Jesus and begs him, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and she's very sick, and she's about to die. Please come and heal. And Jesus went. And I think we need to be that way with, with our prayers, right? No matter what the prayer is, no matter how big you think it is, God can do anything. There's no request too big for God. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O oh Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and earth by your great power, and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. So you think about who God is and what he is able to do. God made the entire universe and everything in it just by speaking it into existence. Like it says in, in the verse I just read, he made the heavens and the earth. He has great power and nothing is too difficult for God. You think of all the things that we read about in, in the Bible and all these things that they have in mind, these, these disciples here, that God made the earth and the heavens, that he rescued his people out of Egypt with great signs and wonders, that he split the sea so that his people can walk through on dry ground. And one of the, one of the things that, that I, it always sticks out to me is when I was, I'm reading through the book of Joshua, and it's in chapter 10, it's one of my favorite uh, stories. Uh, they're fighting the enemy, the Amalekites, and they're fighting, and, and, and Joshua turns in prayer to God and asks God to stop the sun and the moon in the sky. I was like, what? If I'm one of the soldiers standing next to Joshua, I'm like, are you serious? You're asking God to stop the sun? Like, the sun and the moon don't stop in the sky, Joshua. That doesn't happen. That's, why are you asking for that? That's, that's just crazy, right? But the crazy thing is that he did it. God stopped the sun and the moon in the sky so that they could finish the battle. And the amazing thing that that passage highlights is not that the sun and the moon stopped in the sky. That wasn't the amazing part of it. The amazing part was that God responded to the prayers of Joshua. He listened to a man and acted. And we'll talk more about prayer in just a minute, but I, I, that's one of the things that just goes to show that God can do absolutely anything. Matthew 17, 20 says, for I truly, I tell you, this is Jesus, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. So again, just goes to show that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible for God. God can do absolutely anything. We go to the next verse, verse 39. It says Peter got there, and then when he arrived, uh, the people approached him, and they were weeping. They were weeping. Again, just uh, pointing to the, the, the sadness, the, the grief that is associated with death. Here is a, a good woman who, who died. It doesn't say her age, but you can assume that she's probably older and um, you know, well-loved, well-known in the community, and, and it affected, the death effect affected many people. There was sadness, there was grief, there was, there was mourning, right? And we, we read about throughout Scripture, and, and it plays out every day in this life. You know, people die and leave, leave loved ones behind. And there's, there's 
this, this void, there's this person that's missing that was here and, and I knew and I loved. Now this person's not here anymore. Right? And, and, and that's sadness, right? Even Jesus himself, when Lazarus died, he wept. He wept. Even though Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do in a few minutes, that he was going to call Lazarus to come out of the tomb and raise him back to life, he knew he, was, he still wept because he saw the grief, the absolute devastation that is associated with death. So everybody's weeping. Everybody's mourning in that situation. And um, going back to Jesus, when he, when he was begged by that man, Jairus, to heal his daughter, um, he, he encounters a room full of mourning people. People are just weeping. And, and, and again, the devastation that, that follows death. Uh, then it says that these people, the widows, were showing him the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. So when I first read it and kind of got into studying this passage, like, why are they showing clothes to, to Peter? Like, that's, uh, why is that important? Why is that uh, something that they would bother doing in, the, in their state of mind? Uh, and then, you know, as, as I got to think about it, this was the proof of what kind of person she was, right? This is the evidence. This is what uh, she had to show for her life of service to God. And it, it got me thinking, like, you know, at the end of my life when I'm gone, what will there be to show for it? What will be the evidence of who I was, right? And I think that's something each one of, each one of us needs to think about. You know, what am I leaving behind? What am I showing for my life? So they're showing Peter these clothes, and they're pr probably asking Peter, why, why did this happen? Why did this happen to her? Look at what kind of person she was. Why did God take her, of all people, why did, she, why did they take her away? And, and perhaps we've had questions similar, maybe not regarding uh, a person who's died necessarily, but just in general, why do bad things happen? Why, why, God, did you allow this to happen? Why do bad things happen to, to good people? Right? And usually we think that of ourselves when something bad happens to us. right? Like, God, why is this happening to me? right? And, and then we point to all the things that we but God, I do this, and God, I do that, right? And, and usually that's not a clarifying question. We're not asking God, hey, God, can you please explain, give me a detailed uh, outline about why these things are happening and what you're going to... No, it's, it's, it, it, a lot of times it's more of a, uh, an accusation, like how could you, how dare you do, right? But we got to understand that God has plans and purposes above what, what we can see, right? Like it says in Isaiah, his ways are, are above our ways, right? His thoughts above ours. Then we get to verse 40. And it says that Peter sent them all out of the room. And he knelt down and he prayed. Right, And at this point, I want to emphasize the importance of prayer. Every time I teach the, the little kids or I teach the youth or I, I am privileged enough to, to get up in, in front of a, a congregation. And, and, and I, I always emphasize the importance of, of prayer. And uh, I think one of the reasons for that is because, you know, I'm talking to myself as well. Uh, this morning, right, I, I, was, I was woken up early and I couldn't get back to sleep. And, um, you know, I always tell people, whenever God wakes you up early, he probably wants you to pray, right? And whenever you can't sleep, that's probably a good time to pray. But did I do that? <laughs> did I do that right away? I, I did that eventually because I'm like, hey, I'm teaching about this. Maybe I should. <laughs> but... Usually that's not where we go, right? Um, I, I, I taught the youth the, the other day, um, and, and uh, again, uh, it was a passage about Peter and that he went. It was, it was like lunchtime, and he went on the roof to pray. And I said, this is Peter, and, and he's just waiting for lunch, so he had some free time. So what did he do? He went to go pray. Like, what do we do in our free time? And the kids say, mm, we play, play, watch YouTube, or... You know, playing our phones, whatever, right? And and it, in these days, in, in this age, it's just so easy just to do that, right? Do something that we can turn off our brains and just kind of kill time, right? And time, maybe time's not something God wants us to kill. Maybe time's something that God wants us to use. And one of the best uses of our time is to pray to Him. 
And another important thing about prayer is that prayer is something that everybody can do, right? Not everybody uh, has has the, the willingness or ability to you know, teach a Bible study or a group of people or to get up in front and, and, and sing you know, and lead in worship or stuff like that. Not everybody has those kinds of gifts, but every single person can pray. From the youngest of us to the oldest of us, we can all pray to God. Uh, this is what Spurgeon says about prayer. We cannot all argue, but we can all pray. We can all, all be leaders but we can all be pleaders. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. And one of my favorite passages about prayer is in, in James chapter 5, it's, and it, it relates to healing as well. It says, anyone among you suffering, he should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing songs of praises, which you know, kind of uh, singing songs of praises is kind of another version of prayer. Um, is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, with uh, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. And he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. So that, that last part about Elijah, like that really gets to me. Because, you know, it, when you read in, in, in Kings, uh, First Kings about Elijah and how he uh, told Ahab, hey, it's not going to rain on the land for three years. It doesn't say that, you know, necessarily that he prayed about that, but we, we find this out later as we read in James that the reason that it didn't rain is because Elijah prayed for that and God moved in response to his prayer. And I think that's amazing. And then we get this idea, it's like, well, that's Elijah, right? Like he's, he's a superhero, right? He's, he's one of these guys that are, that are up here, and, you know, like tight with God, you know? But it says in the passage, it says, Elijah was a human being just as we are. Okay, so this, the, God, the same way that God listened to Elijah and stopped the rain from falling, the same way that God listened to Joshua and stopped the sun and the moon in the sky, he also listens to us and hears our prayers. So we don't have to be like superhero of the Bible person for God to hear us. God hears each and every one of us. So that should motivate us to to pray. And that's what Peter did here. He prayed. Then in verse 40, uh, after his prayer, he tells Tabitha, get up. And as I was studying this, uh, there was this really cool connection to uh, the healing that Jesus did, uh, that, that little girl that I spoke about earlier in Mark chapter 5. This is what David Gusick says. Peter seemed to clearly remember what Jesus did in Mark 5. In that healing, Jesus said, Talitha, kumai. Peter said here in the original language, Tabitha Kumai. Peter could hear Jesus' words in his head as he ministered. Peter simply tried to do as Jesus did. Jesus was his leader. He wasn't trying to lead Jesus anymore, as he did when he told Jesus not to go in the way, not to go the way of the cross in Matthew 16, 22. Now Peter was letting Jesus lead him. So he was imitating. Jesus, in the way that he healed that little girl, that's what Peter did. That's the approach he took. And I think that's a lesson for us, that we should seek to imitate Christ. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul writes, imitate me as I also imitate Christ, because Christ is the only one worth imitating. Then we go to verse 41. After the healing, after she gets up, uh, it says, uh, He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. He called the saints and widows and presented her alive. So I can just imagine, right? Like, if you want to you know, put yourself there, right? And you, you, you know this lady died, right? And all of a sudden, she was in the upstairs room. You see her walking down the stairs, or I don't know if they had ladders. I don't know how the floor plan was. But you see her and, and eyes wide jaw drop like what are you serious this just happened 
Like she just died and now she's walking around like nothing. Right? That's, that's amazing. Right? And you can bet she has this big smile on her face. Maybe she's skipping down the stairs or whatever the case may be. Right? She's a, she was dead and now she's alive. And that's God's power. Right? That's the evidence of God's power. That's a testimony to his goodness, his kindness, and his grace. And guess what? We all have a testimony. Obviously not of being dead and coming back to life physically, but spiritually we do, right? Because God has, God has come into our lives, right? His grace has come into our lives and has saved us, right? Because we were dead in our sins, but now we're alive in Christ. So we have that testimony to share with others, and God uses that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. And then it flips. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus so our testimony, our being dead in sins and, and now alive in Christ, that is evidence of God's goodness, of his grace, of his kindness, and it's something that we definitely need to share with people. Because we were all the prodigal son. We were all dead and now we're alive. We were all lost, but now we're found. Uh, this is what Gusick says. It says, Dorcas wasn't raised for her own sake. She would have enjoyed heaven better. She was raised for the sake of her ministry to others, in which, which is the same reason we have passed from death into life. So speaking of that, uh, in, in our passage today, we see that these two healings have an effect, not, on the, not just on the people that were healed, but on everybody that, that found out about it, that were witnesses or that heard about it. So we go to uh, back a little bit to b- verse 35 where it says, so all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So, so this is going back again to the first healing of Aeneas, the paralyzed man, and they saw him, right? They're like, hey, isn't that that guy that was just paralyzed, right? You can imagine, right? And he's now walking around. If I were him, I would be running around, right? Because I, I, I got my legs back and I, I, can, I can move and jumping around. And, you know, when God heals somebody, like, he's not just going to do like a shuffle, right? Like, oh, you, at least you could walk now. No, he's like fully healed. And, and you know, so if I'm him, I'm, I'm doing like somersaults, backflips, whatever, right? And, and people see that and they're like, wait, wasn't that the, that was the guy that, that was paralyzed? So they were all witnesses to it. And they were amazed, right? Obviously, that's an amazing thing. If you see someone who's paralyzed for eight years and now they're, they're up and moving around, that's an amazing thing. Uh, but the thing is, they were not amazed by Peter. Peter was just the instrument. They were amazed by God. So the purpose was to give glory to God and to turn people to God, not to Peter, right? It's not like, oh, that Peter's awesome. I'm going to follow Peter. I'm going to be like his biggest fan and, and, and everything. I'll have Peter t-shirts made and, and everything. No, no, this was about God. And Peter would probably be the, be the first to, to give glory to God and tell people, no, no, this isn't about me, guys. This is about what God has done, right? And guess what? That anytime that we do something, obviously, you know, not that amazing, but anytime we do something good, it says that we should give glory to God and that our good works that we do should turn people to God and they should give God the glory. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So our good works, the purpose of our good works, and God using us in that way, and the purpose of the healing that we see with Aeneas was to give glory to God. Then we go to verse uh, 42, 
And this is after Tabitha's healing that we see, uh, it says, this became known throughout Joppa and many believed in the Lord. So it says that it became known, right? This, this lady who died, now she's alive and everybody knew it, right? They didn't need social media back then for the word to get out. You know, this, this news went viral without Twitter, without YouTube, anything like that. People found out, they knew about it. And it says that uh, uh, throughout Joppa, the entire city, everybody knew, right? And it says in the second half of that verse, many believed in the Lord. So it wasn't just like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to tell everybody I know about this because, you know, this is just, but it actually was designed by God to turn people to him. It says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So God used this miracle, this physical healing to bring about the spiritual healing of many people, right? This miracle um, was used by God to save many people in Jesus, right? Tap of the, because here's, here's, here's the point, right? Here, here's what it comes down to. Even though she was raised from the dead, right? And she was happy at that moment and everybody was cheering and sharing the news and celebrating. They probably had a party about it. Um, Tabitha would eventually, I don't know how many years later, but she would eventually die, right? Eventually that's what happens to everybody. Lazarus, right? When we read about in, in John and how he was uh, dramatically raised from the dead and they had to move the stone away and he was wrapped up in the grave clothes and everything, he, he was alive and everybody was happy and, and amazed by it, but eventually Lazarus would die again. Um, and, and it just goes to show that, you know, people can, can beat diseases, right? You see it all the time where, you know, the cancer and, the, and you have the cancer survivors, right? And that's great and that's awesome and that's a testament to God. Um, people can beat diseases, they can overcome uh, the most dramatic injuries. And, I, you know, you've seen, you've heard stories of people that, you know, they had this awful accident and they can't walk, but eventually they get to the point where they can walk again. They beat that injury, they overcome it. However, all this, everybody eventually will die, right? We cannot prevent death, which, which goes to show that having Jesus and, and, and securing that eternal life is, is way more important than having health. No matter how, you can live 100 years, but if you don't know Jesus, then it was a loss. And then we, uh, we finish out this, this section with verse 43, where it says that Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. And this may seem kind of like, you know, like we're on this high right here, and then it just says kind of like this, this weird detail at the end, right? Maybe it's like, okay, well, who cares well, you know, you know, what, what he, where he's staying? Uh, but it's not an insignificant detail. Um, so it could have been that Peter uh, could have left on this high, like, man, I just healed two people. I'm out of here. Let's see what else I can do, who else I can heal, right? I'm just going to go around and, and just, you know, heal paralyzed guys and, and raise dead people. from. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that because he realized the importance of ministering to those people. Because what do we see? We see a bunch of people turning to the Lord, a lot of people believing in Jesus. So guess what? Peter has a group of people that he needs to disciple. They need to learn and put into practice the things that they learn, right? So Peter has a job there. So he stays there. And, uh, you know, being in ministry, a lot of times people think that you got to go somewhere, like you got to go to one of these big cities so that you can have this big church and minister to a bunch of people. But that's not what it's about. God wants us to, to minister to, to the person that, that's near us, the people that are near us, and to affect them, right? No matter how big or small the congregation is, um, we are not called to, to, to abandon our people and go somewhere else, but to minister and be a blessing where we are at. And sometimes God does call us elsewhere, but most of the time, God wants us to be where we're at and be a blessing to the people that are near us. So uh, going back to kind of our outline, uh, we saw all of the, uh, the healings that, that occurred and including and most importantly, the, the healing of the uh, people who uh, were 
were dead in their sins and, and came to life in Christ. They, they believed and they were saved. That's the significance. That's the importance. And going back to the question, the significance of the physical healing, uh, I found this good summary uh, of it uh, as I was studying. It's from a website called gotquestions.org. And uh, let me just read it to you. It says, sometimes people are physically healed when they place their faith in Christ. But this is not always the case. Sometimes it is God's will to heal, but sometimes it is not. God still performs miracles. He still heals people. Sickness, disease, pain, and death are still realities in this world. Unless the Lord returns, everyone who is alive today will die. And the vast majority of them, Christians included, will die as a result of a physical problem, a disease, a sickness, injury. It is not, God, it is not always God's will to heal us physically. Ultimately, our physical healing awaits us in heaven. In heaven, there will be no more pain sickness, disease, suffering, or death, as we see in Revelation 21. We all need to be less preoccupied with our physical condition in this world, not that it's not important, but less preoccupied, and a lot more concerned with our spiritual condition. We can focus our hearts on heaven, where we will no longer have to deal with physical problems. Revelation 21.4 describes the true healing we should all be longing for. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will, be, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So what do we learn? We learn that the spiritual is much more significant than the physical. And that the physical healings that we see here, the purpose uh, was to pave the way for the spiritual healing that we saw. It's also a picture of the spiritual healing that exists for those who uh, put their faith in Jesus. We learn that forgiveness of our sins is, is much greater a thing than just feeling better physically. And ultimately, it points us, as we just read, it points us to heaven. These physical healings, it reminds us that things aren't the way that they should be due to sin, and things aren't the way that they will be when we are in heaven. And uh, I would just like to... Uh, kind of conclude with this passage. I, I referred a lot to Lazarus, and uh, this is the conversation that Jesus had with Martha, uh, Lazarus' sister, right before he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I think that's something, a question that every single person needs to answer. Because you can see it is literally a question that concerns life and death. Do you believe this? So as, as we close, um, I, I just want to urge you guys to, to everyone, if, if you need spiritual, or if you need physical healing, or know somebody that needs physical healing, then we go to God in prayer. Ask for prayer for it. And more importantly, if you know somebody that needs spiritual healing, if they need their sins forgiven so that they can be with Jesus in heaven for eternity, and that's where we go to God in prayer because only God can change the heart and bring a person to himself. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I give you the glory, and I thank you for, uh, for your word and what we've read today in it, Lord, and, and uh, all the encouragement that we find in it, Lord, about how you uh, can do anything, Lord, that nothing is impossible for you, Lord, and you call us to, to come to you, Lord, in prayer, in supplication, Lord. You call us to uh, uh, just ask of, of, of you, Lord, as, as the children that we are and as, as the Father that you are to us, and, and we... we understand, Lord, that, that you do amazing, great things, Father God. Uh, but we know that the, the greatest thing that you do for us, Lord, is that you forgive us of our sins, that you, uh, though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that you um, uh, make us alive in Christ, that you give us a new life, that you turn us into a new creation in Christ, and we have that testimony, Lord, that we can share with others because we want others to, to know of this, to, to be able to uh, partake in this forgiveness that you offer. Lord, you are a great God. You are merciful. 
And we know that, Lord, like it says in, 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 in your word, in Revelation, Lord, uh, all the, the, the pain and the suffering and the death and the disease, everything will be gone. And we get to be with you in heaven forever uh, with the saints, praising you and worshiping you uh, forever. So we give you thanks and we give you praise and we glorify your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And just a beautiful message of, of hope and just assurance, I think, in Christ Jesus. And uh, this morning, as, as, as Robert mentioned, if you need a, a spiritual healing, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you're here in person or if you're watching on the live stream and uh, you want to give your life to, to the Lord, you want that spiritual healing in your life, you want a hope, you want a future in Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity um, now, this morning. And um, if that's you, if you could just repeat this prayer with me. You have to say this with your whole heart. This has to be wholeheartedly. This can't be your lip service. You're dedicating your life to the Lord. And um, if that's you this morning, if you just close your eyes, bow your head, and just repeat this prayer uh, with me or after me. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, this morning I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And we assure you that there's a celebration going on in heaven on your behalf. Um, if you have any questions, maybe some next steps, you can reach out to our church. If you need a Bible, you need prayer, anything like that, let us know. Um, or come by and visit us. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. here at 4242 Hondo Pass, uh, Suite 100, uh, at the intersection of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. We're praying for you. Thank you so much for spending this, this time with us here. If you come across this at a later time, we hope that you're blessed by the message this morning. And um, we love you. We're praying for you. We hope to see you again very soon here.